Here we go. We're recording. And we'll wait just another minute, but I'll go ahead and share my PowerPoint. There we go. We'll get <clears throat> we'll get started here in just just a minute. We usually have a few people stop by right here about uh, four or five minutes. Well, I'm curious what you will do with this story. <laughs> There's Marty. Marty Leffler's here. Hey, Marty. We may have a few other folks join us, but uh, I'll just admit them as, as they come in. So, listen, this is, uh, uh, you know, we've got tonight. The, the 14th, then next week, uh, I'm going to take the Tower of Babel and kind of kind of wrap things up, uh, wrap things up for the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And then on the last uh, uh, Wednesday in April, it'll be an open forum. And so I, I, I'll prepare just a few thoughts, maybe 10, 15 minutes worth. And then, uh, and then we'll just open it up. We can talk about Genesis chapters 1 through 11 or, or what God starts doing in Genesis chapter 12. Or, or we can talk about economics or we can talk about uh, uh, anything that, that you guys want to talk about. So uh, that's, that's the plan for the next, uh, after tonight, and that plan for the next two Wednesday nights is to talk about the Tower of Babel and then, then have an open forum. So anyway, plan for that. Still haven't heard if, they've even, if we've even got any plans for anything in May with regard to Wednesday night or not. But uh, No, but I would love to hear from people uh, beyond this. What kinds of things would you like to do? Uh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, let me know, shoot me an email or, or talk to me at church or call me or whatever. Yeah. So there's plenty of options, plenty of options. All right, here we go. We're going to take this, this kind of nasty little story that, that takes place right after, uh, uh, Noah and his family exit uh, from the ark. I called it drunk and disorderly, and it's just, it's, it's not a pleasant story, but it's there, and uh, so we'll, we'll deal with it. But before we do, before we get into that, we need to go play our favorite game show called Quotes from Jay. This past Sunday, uh, Jay did definitely uh, reference uh, Genesis chapter 1 through 11, Anybody remember yes. the, the, the section that he went over? Oh, the section? Oh. Or, or, or the, some thoughts or whatever it is. Rest. Yes. Thank you, Lindsay. Very good. Lindsay wins the prize. <laughs> Which I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, Lindsay, Lindsay just won it. Yeah. Jay talked about the three different meanings of rest. Um, he, he talked about God resting on the seventh day, obviously from Genesis chapter one. And then he talked about the rest of the promised land, uh, you know, later on in uh, uh, Genesis and, and especially in Exodus about the rest of the promised land. And then they talked, he talked about the eternal rest uh, that will come. The only thing Jay didn't talk about, which I'm, I'm very disappointed he didn't talk about this, is how in the world am I going to get any rest? I, I don't exactly know what that means for me right now, today. You know, what does, am I supposed to rest on Sunday? What does that mean? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but we'll leave that for another time. All right. Thanks, Jay, for, for, for reviewing that. Okay, let's talk about 
exit from the ark. I, I talked about this last week to kind of review back what we went over last week. We talked about Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages that is on the back of our $1 bill. And it's because the founding fathers of the United States believed that they were establishing a new order, trying something that had never been tried before in the history of mankind. And really, uh, I think they were probably to some extent correct. But uh, certainly here in Genesis chapter 11, there's several new orders of the ages. Uh, the first one, the first new order was certainly the age of innocence. Uh, Adam and Eve from the creation to the fall, uh, that was a new order. It was God establishing something new that had never been done before. And that didn't, apparently didn't last very long. Uh, who knows, uh, the, the, the dates on these things are tricky. I'm not sure the dates are meant to be absolute dates. Uh, I think they're more of a theological thing, but uh, I don't think the, the Garden of Eden happened very long. And then they tried the age without law. God was kind of counseling Cain, says don't kill your brother, but Cain ignored him. And then that kind of had as a culmination in this guy, that's meant to represent Lamech, uh, the poet, first poet in the Bible, first uh, uh, polygamist. Uh, and in the age without law, God, God said, this doesn't work. You guys can't live decently and in order in an age without law. And so he sent the flood. After the flood, God uh, established law and covenant. He said, I won't destroy the world by water anymore. And if you kill somebody by man, shall you be killed? I mean, he, he said, you, you guys are going to have to police each other. And we talked about that one, obviously, last week. Then there's a little bit of a new order of the ages as well when we get to the Tower of Babel. And so you definitely have these four stages of ancient history uh, in the uh, in the uh, in, in the first 11 chapters, and we of course talked about the uh, exit from the Ark, uh, Law and Covenant uh, last week. All right, here's what I plan on doing tonight. Here's what I plan on doing tonight. I want to talk about hope and procreation. Okay, I want to talk about hope and uh, the fact that children start being born again. I want to talk a little bit about prototypical stories. Whenever we see a first story in the Bible, the first story of a man and a woman, the first story of brothers together, the first story of a man dealing with his sons, those are prototypical. They're meant to illustrate something fundamental about uh, the way that we uh, live with and have relationship with each other. So I want to talk about prototypical stories. Then I want to talk about the boys. I want to talk about Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I want to talk about what their names mean. I want to talk about which one was the oldest, which one was the middle, and which one was the youngest, because I think that's interesting. I want to talk about Noah as a husband and as a father, because this is one of these typical, prototypical stories about things to do, things not to do as a husband, things to do, things not to do as a father. Now I want to talk about Shem and Japheth versus Ham, because there's definitely a, a, a division here. Then after this little nasty little story is over, Noah actually speaks for the first time. Noah is not recorded as speaking until the, the flood is all over, till uh, Ham uncovers the nakedness of his father, and then Noah wakes up and then he talks, then he talks. And of course, what he speaks is a blessing and a curse. And then I want to end up with uh, a review of some genealogies again, because there's several genealogies that take place, and we need to get at least through some of those before we get to the Tower of Babel. That's the plan. That's what I want to do. I want to talk about hope. I want to talk about hope. When God gave his covenant when he puts the rainbow in the uh in the sky and said this is a a symbol of my covenant and promise to you guys that i'm not going to send a flood 
to cover the entire earth. Doesn't mean there won't be local floods. But with God's covenant, there is hope for our future. For you and me, you and I have hope for the future because we can rest assured that God's not going to destroy this earth again. We can be confident about the future free from natural cataclysm. That doesn't mean there won't be localized floods. I assume this is Louisiana where I got this picture from. But God's not going to destroy us all over again. Uh, I, I, occasionally I'll talk to students and that you see kind of fear that, oh, the things aren't going well. No, things are going pretty well and God's, God's not going to destroy this earth again. Uh, there's hope for the future. With God's covenant, there's, there's hope for an enduring future free from natural cataclysm, but with God's law, there's hope for social order, free from homicide, free from violence. There'll be localized uh, violence, that's for sure. We see it all the time, those of us that came from Portland and what we see happening in, in Minneapolis. Uh, there's violence going on, there's violence, but, but, but there's, there's still law and uh, there still is the hope that we can live in a society largely free from violence and homicide. Most of us live our daily lives really not in fear of, of, of being uh, you know, harmed in any way. I mean, I've lived a long time. You take your bumps every now and then, but no, I, I, I don't live in fear. I, I live in hope that we are going to have an orderly and decent society. Because of that, one of the first things, among many things, one of the first things that happen when they emerge from the ark is they get to the business of procreation. <laughs> they, get, they, they start having children. One year upon exiting the ark, it's recorded that Shem had the first post-ark, post-flood child. Uh, just interesting side note, not sure what it means, but uh, there's a, a definite line of theological thought that all four couples uh, refrain from having sex and, and therefore having children while they were on the ark. Can't prove it, it's just kind of interesting, but they didn't start having children. They had no children on the ark, they were on there for a year, so they could have, but none were recorded. And then they didn't really start having the first recorded child was one year after the, uh, after the flood. And so, you know, the, the idea is that we have with covenant and law, we have hope for the future. And therefore we can get about the business of what God told us to do, which was be fruitful and multiply. Uh, we'll get to the, the filling the earth one uh, when we get to the Tower of Babel. They didn't really do the fill the earth, but they got after the, the fruitful and multiply aspect of it. Again, I think we need to learn from first events in, the, uh, in, this, in this narrative of, of the first 11 chapters. We learn from Adam and Eve part of what it means to be a husband and wife. When you're a husband and wife, you don't start blaming the other one when something goes bad. That's something we can learn from the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, things go bad, well, it's Lori's fault. Or, oh, uh, no, it's, it's, you know, it's Biddy's fault. You know, she, she's the one that, 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 that did this. No, 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 husband and wife, you don't, you don't blame the other one when something goes bad or something goes wrong. You, you stick together. And so we learn from these first events about what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife. We learn what it means to be a brother. We learn that, uh, no, you may want to kill your brother, all right? You may be angry with your brother, but you don't do that. That's not what is done uh, between brothers, okay? And we learn from Noah a little bit about how to be a father and especially about how to be a husband. We learn about how to be a husband from, from the story of Noah. And so I think these are prototypical. They're, they're, they're uh, first things in terms of, of learning. A lot of times we learn from the negative, not necessarily the positive. We, 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 we learn from the positive, but we also learn from the negative. 
interestingly, at least it's interesting to me, in these first stories, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, there are no stories about mothers and daughters. <laughs> Moms and daughters aren't, aren't mentioned. Daughters are mentioned, mothers are mentioned, but there's no stories about mothers and daughters. There's no stories about mothers and sons, okay? There's no stories about sisters. There's stories about brothers. There's stories about fathers and sons. There's stories about brothers, but there's no stories about these other ways. And the only conclusion that you can kind of draw from that is that men need more direction and training. Men need more direction and training. Uh, I think God was, was wise. I think he realized that we are, we, I say we, meaning all men, we're uh, the weirder of the two. We, we don't take certain things naturally and uh, we need more education and training uh, uh, than, uh, than, than the ladies. Uh, that's, I, I'd love to hear some comments about that, but I, maybe there's other lessons we can draw from it, but certainly, in fact, through most of Genesis, the emphasis is not on training, uh, wives. It's not on training, uh, ladies. It's on training fathers, how to be a father, how to be a husband how to uh, treat your children. Uh, you know, we learned the, the, from the basic story of Abraham and Sarah. No, she's your wife, she's not your sister. We learned from the story of uh, uh, Jacob. No, you can't play favorites with your sons. You can't do that. So a lot of things we can learn. All right. Finally, to this nasty little story, just, it's a cringe-worthy story. It, it, it may, it's one of those stories that makes us uncomfortable, like makes me uncomfortable. Noah exits the ark, plants a vineyard, harvests the white grapes, makes the wine, gets drunk, naked in his tent. All right, naked in his tent. Ham, his middle son, comes in, sees his father, drunk and naked. And basically, I think the best word that I could come up with, he traffics in his father's condition. He, he doesn't shut up. He's not quiet about it. He doesn't cover his father. He doesn't say, oh, that's, oh, I wish dad hadn't done that. Let me cover him up and goes and be quiet. No, he he tells, he, he makes fun of, he traffics in his father's condition. Shem and Japheth, on the other hand, uh, put a mantle over their backs, walk backwards into their father's tent and cover their father. And it's all kind of in that little picture there. Uh, there were several pretty good uh, artistic renderings of, of what happened there. Noah wakes up. And as I said, for the first time in all the Old Testament, Noah talks, Noah speaks. And the only thing he does is speak to pronounce a curse and a blessing, all right? Curse on Ham, blessing on Shem and Japheth. Again, a prototypical story. Noah probably needs some help as a husband and as a father. Uh, he's, he's got some failings here. Noah's a good guy. But we've learned before that when God told Noah to exit the ark with his wife and then his sons and then his son's wife, uh, God told Noah to reverse the order that they entered the ark when they exited the ark. Noah, of course, did not. Noah did not obey. We think of Noah as obeying God, and he did. He, he built the ark, but he wasn't, he wasn't pure. And, and doing all that God told him to do. Which begs the question, when you think about this story, where was Mrs. Noah? 
where was Mrs. Noah in all of this thing? Because it says that Noah was drunk and naked in his own tent. Well, if he's in his own tent, where's Mrs. Noah on all this thing? And, uh, you know, you can't help but get the conclusion that the fact that Noah did not honor his wife creates an opportunity for Ham. The fact that, that Noah came out of the ark with his sons, I guess means that his sons were still around his tent. And Mrs. Noah, don't know where she is, but uh, I've often thought that, uh, you know, if, if you've got a good wife and you're laying there drunk and naked in the house, she'll say, oh, silly old man, I told him not to drink all that wine. Oh, goodness, come on, let me get a cover for him. He doesn't need to be laying around here like this. And she, would, she wouldn't traffic in it. No, that's her man. That's her husband. And yes, he's a silly old man, but he, she's not going to say that. She's just going to take care of him like our wives do take care of us, silly old men, all right? That's what, that's part of the job description. And uh, she wasn't around. She wasn't around. Why not? Well, you can't help but tie it back to the exit from the ark. You can't help but tie it back. The other thing is that this nakedness is an echo of the story of Adam and Eve. You know, the, 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 the whole flood narrative is an echo of the Garden of Eden. It's an echo of, of uh, you know, the original man, the, 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 the leader that's left. Now, there's differences, there's subtle differences. But in the, the story of the garden, the garden came out of a watery tobu, babohu, came out of the watery mass upon which the Spirit of God was, was hovering. Only in this case, you had a watery mass with a little ark on it bouncing around over the waves. And then you have this, this, this original, I think I've got a slide on this, so I better not get ahead of myself. But if you compare the stories of, of the Garden of Eden with the story of the flood, there's parallels, slight differences, but parallels uh, all, all through that, that, that story. I, I didn't create a slide on all that, but there is that. So anyway, remember that this is kind of an echo of the, of the, the Garden of Eden story. Now we got the three sons. Let's talk about the three sons. Three sons are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They're always listed in that order, but that's not the birth order. A lot of times in the Bible, the birth order is the oldest is listed first, the middle one's listed second, and the youngest is listed third, and that's not true. That's not true. First off, their names, Shem means name or renowned, a renowned name. Ham, and, and names mean something back then. We didn't, we hadn't talked a lot about what names mean, but uh, back then, name means something. We, didn't, we don't attach as much meaning to names these day, days. Uh, you know, we just, we just call people by their name, but it doesn't mean, they, but names meant something back then. Shem was the middle boy. Shem was the middle one. Uh, we know this by looking at Genesis chapter 10, when they emerged from the ark and comparing that to uh, when, when Japheth uh, was born. And so Shem was the middle boy. He was the middle one. Ham, on the other hand, means hot or flammable or ignitable or combustible. Okay, And Ham was the youngest boy. Genesis 9.24 tells us that Ham was the youngest, okay? So you had a young hothead. His name was Ham. Japheth, on the other hand, means open, expanded, or beautiful, okay? And Japheth was the oldest. And so Japheth is always listed last, and yet he was the oldest. Ham's always mentioned in the middle, yet he was the youngest. Shem's always mentioned first, 
He was the middle boy. He was the middle one. All right. Given all that, Noah wakes up. Noah's drunk and naked in his tent. Mrs. Noah is nowhere to be around. Shem sees his father lying naked in his tent, traffics in it, makes fun of his father, uh, uncovers his nakedness. Uh, you know, it, it's just a nasty little situation. Shem and Japheth put a cloak on the back of their, a blanket on the back of their shoulders, walk backwards, don't see their father's nakedness, but cover him up. Noah wakes up. Noah wakes up. Says he knows something happened to him. Well, if he was drunk and, and passed out in his tent, how did he know something happened to him? We don't know. Just says he knows something happened to him. And he knows it was Ham. Whether or not God told him, whether or not Mrs. Noah told him, whether or not uh, he just knew his sons well enough to know that I had something happened to me, and I bet it was Ham. It just says, something happened. I know it was Ham. I know it was him. So for the first time in all the Bible, in all this Noah narrative, flood narrative, Noah speaks. And when he speaks, he speaks a curse. He speaks a blessing. All right. So that's what Noah does. He speaks for the very first time. He speaks a curse and he speaks a blessing. What's the curse? The curse is, and I quote it in full here, cursed be Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. A slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. Another one of these times where you go, huh, what, 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 what? what? Ham was the one that uncovered the nakedness of his father. Why did God curse, or did, excuse me, Noah curse Canaan because of what his father did? Why? Why, when, Can when Noah pronounces a curse, does it go all the way back to, no to Ham's son? Don't know how old Canaan was. Uh, had to be at least enough time go by that, that Noah developed a vineyard and they came into ripeness and he had to let it ferment for a while. Also had to be enough time for, for Ham to have children. So who knows how long, but you know, four, five, eight years, who knows? We don't know, but uh, you know, maybe Canaan was just a little guy running around the tents. But God doesn't curse Ham. God curses Ham's son, Canaan. I'd love to hear some thoughts on this. The best one I can come up with is because of what Ham did to Noah, Noah is doing to Ham. What Ham did was defather Noah. What Ham did was, was, was uh, put difficulty in Noah's ability to be a father. He, he, he degraded his father. He made his father look small. He made his father, you know, uh, he made it more difficult for Noah to be a father. And so in the same way, the curse on Ham is, it's going to be more difficult for Ham to be a father because Canaan knows that his grandfather cursed him because it's what his father did. That all makes sense. That all makes sense. So the curse falls on Canaan. And if we look forward into Genesis, if we look forward into Genesis, Canaanites, after Ham's son, become known for their sexual misconduct. 
uh, it's Canaanites that are the the ones that 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 are kind of the opposite of the Israelites. Israelites have multiple wives, but they're expected to be faithful to their wives. Canaanites, not so much. Sodom and Gomorrah were Canaanite cities. Sodom and Gomorrah were Canaanite cities. Uh, we don't need to get into all that detail on Sodom and Gomorrah. If we ever move on into Genesis, we'll talk about Sodom and Gomorrah later on, but uh, you know, known for their uh, homosexuality. It was a Canaanite prince who raped Dinah in Genesis chapter 34. So it's a Canaanite prince. And even more disgusting is Lot's daughters were born to a Canaanite woman. Lot's daughters, when Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt and they were dwelling in the caves above Sodom and Gomorrah, and they say, we need to have, uh, if you're right, we'll, we'll make our father drunk and have sex with him. And we, of course, get the people of uh, Edom and Moab. I think it's Edom and Moab come from the daughters of uh, the granddaughter, grandsons of, uh, of Lot, of Lot. So you get all this sort of uh, sexual difficulty, just put it that way. And that's the opposite Canaan, Canaan, of, of, of the Hebrews, but Canaan represents sexual sin, rebellion from God, which is slavery, even today. Those who, who fall prey to the to thinking that sexual conquest, sexual unfaithfulness is a uh, fun thing. Uh, no, eventually you become enslaved to it. And I, I think that's the modern interpretation of the curse on Canaan, is that uh, it becomes uh, sexual unfaithfulness to, instead of being faithful to one woman, your wife, uh, you, you, you have all sorts of, I don't even like talking about it, but uh, anyway, you, you guys got the idea. Uh, that's need to get a psychologist or a sociologist to talk about sex. I'm an economist. Uh, yeah. Then Noah pronounces a blessing. He pronounces the curse on, uh, Can on, on Canaan as a result of Ham's misconduct. Then he blesses Blessed, uh, blessed by the Lord my God, uh, be Shem. Let Canaan be his slave. God enlarged Japheth. Let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. So I, you know, Canaan has a triple kind of uh, curse. Not only did he get cursed because his fathers did, but he, he's going to be. Uh, uh, down through the ages, uh, be the slave of, of his uh, two uncles. So we have Shem and Japheth. Shem and Japheth, two boys that, that put this cloak over them and walk backward. Shem's blessing is the greater of the two because Japheth is going to dwell in the house, in the tent of uh, Shem. Japheth dwells in the tent of Shem. In other words, Japheth dwells under the protection of Shem. And to understand that in more detail, you got to go through the genealogies, which we'll get to in just a minute. But Abraham and Jesus come through the line of Shem. So uh, Abraham, the blessing of the Hebrew nation and the blessing to all of us in, uh, in our Savior Jesus come through the line of Shem. And so in that sense, all of us dwell under the protection of, all of us dwell under the tent of Shem, okay? Because, um, because we all dwell under the protection of Jesus. We all dwell under the protection of him. Kind of the final conclusion of this, Noah is not the savior. 
Remember uh, Noah, the son of Lamech, and when uh, Lamech uh, had his poetry, he said, may this child be the person who saves us from our back-breaking labor. And uh, Noah turns out not to be uh, the savior. He's kind of one of these, these uh, pseudo saviors that, that come up every now and then, but obviously Noah, who I will always think of as Russell Crowe, and that's Jennifer Conley, Noah's wife. Uh, it, he did not relieve them from their back-breaking toil. He did walk with God. He did find favor with God. Things are worse than being Noah, okay? But he ended up just like Adam. His sins were exposed to everyone. Uh, he lies, ends up lying naked in his tent, just like Noah, uh, Adam end up naked and exposed to God. And so we need to move on to generations. I'll go through some generations really quickly and then we'll have time for, for some discussion, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Generations of Shem, and I'll probably lead with this next time as well. Shem, the favored son, the middle son, had five kids, Elam, Aser, Arfaxad, Arfaxdad, something like that, Lud, and Aram. Arfaxad had Selah, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Peleg, Ru, Sarah, Nahor, Terah, now we're getting to some familiar names, and Abram. So Arphaxad is the son of Shem, and through Arphaxad, we get all the line through Peleg all the way to Abraham. I, I highlighted Peleg because it says in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, for in those days, the world was divided. Not sure exactly what that means, but that probably refers to the idea that the Tower of Babel was erected during the days of Peleg. But that's just our best guess. And then, of course, it goes all the way down to Abram. Abram is through the line of Shem. Abram comes through the line of Shem. This little uh, chart's been in the back of my Bible ever since I was uh, 13, 12, 13 years old. Uh, when my mama gave me my, uh, my Bible, I've still got. And uh, it kind of shows that Shem is the uh, Semitic, Asiatic peoples. Ham goes down into Africa, probably. And you and I are probably descendants of Japheth. Uh, we believe that he went over to the coastlands and then uh, on up into the European. Don't know for sure. There's no way to tell for sure, but that's our best guess. The generations of Ham are really very, very interesting. And I, again, I didn't cover these up and uncover them, but Ham is recorded as having three sons. Canaan, we already knew about. Canaan was the one that was cursed. They had put, put, we don't know anything about because he didn't have any kids. But he, oh, I went down to Canaan first. Let's stick with Canaan. Canaan had a bunch of kids, Sidon, Heth, Jebu, Amor, Hiv, Ark, Sin, Arvad, if I'm pronouncing any of those correctly. We know Sidon because in red, there's a city named Sidon. It's on, the, it's on the Mediterranean coast, just north of Israel. And so Sidon is a city, Tyre and Sidon, north of there. I circled Jebu because of the Jebusites. It was the Jebusites that created, that, that built the city of Jerusalem. And eventually David conquered the city of Jerusalem and took it over as the capital of, uh, of Israel. But originally it was a Canaanite city by one of the sons of Canaan. And then of course, down at the bottom down here, Sodom and Gomorrah were also Canaanite cities. The ones in red are the cities, the ones in, in the dark are, uh, are, are, are uh, sons or kids of uh, Ham. Egypt was a uh, son of Ham, believe it or not. And so obviously you get the name Egypt from there. 
and you have all of the, uh, the, the ites from, uh, or, or the, the kids of Egypt. The one that I would just point out is this one right here, Kasluhim, and that's where the Philistines come from. Of course, the Philistines were on just north of Egypt, where Gaza is right now, the Gaza Strip, and uh, one of the perennial enemies of the Israelites were the Philistines, were the Philistines. Finally, you have Cush. Cush has uh, had uh, one, two, three, four, six sons. Seba, uh, Havala, Rab, and Nimrod. And Nimrod. Uh, interesting among Cush, of course, is you've got Sheba, the queen of Sheba that came to visit Solomon. And then most importantly for our next story is Nimrod down here. Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. It was also a builder of cities. It was Nimrod that built the Tower of uh, Babel, or the city of Babel. We don't know if Nimrod was around to actually build the tower or not. But, uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. But uh, Nimrod was the one that built Nineveh, and it called the Great City, which we believe to be Babylon. And so all of these cities right here, which become uh, also people that conquered Israel, uh, they come from Nimrod, the son of Cush, the son of Ham. Just another little map. You can find all sorts of maps, but uh, Shem's family generally this way, Ham's family down here. But Ham's family also comes along here to the Fertile Crescent. Babel was part of Ham's family over here. And then Japheth, we believe, Tarshish was over here somewhere. These are the sons of Japheth, not really as well known at all. Uh, the only one that we really kind of know about is Tarshish. That was on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. And it says in Genesis chapter 10, verse 5, from these people, from the, the sons of Japheth, the coastline people spread. These are the sons of Japheth in their land, each in their own language, by their families and in the nations. Now, this is another picture. We believe that the uh, best we could guess, don't know for sure, but right there is where most of this action happened. Ararat may be right over there, the triangle. And then there's where the Shem, Ham, and Japheth took off after the Tower of Babel, especially. Let me go through this real quickly. And then uh, I got, I got, let me, I think it'll take me about two or three minutes, maybe five, to go through the generations from Noah all the way to Abraham. And the Bible gives me numbers. I'm going to count it. I'm going to use the numbers. What we've got right here is, if you will remember, that Noah is the 10th generation from Adam. If Adam is generation number one, then Noah is generation number 10. And then... Abram, all the way down here, is the 20th generation from Adam. You got Noah, number 10. You got Abram, down here, number 20. And right here are all their birth years. These are the years that, this is the year that Noah was born, Shem was born, all the way down to Abram. So Noah was born in the year 1056. Abram was born in 1938. Okay, you start with uh, from the very beginning. We know Noah lived for 950 years. So if he was born in 1056, he died in 2006. Shem, on the other hand, born in 1556, died in 2158 at the age of 602. All right. Our facts had born two years after the beginning of the flood, one year after they exited the ark, was born in 1658. He died in 2096. He just lived for 438 years. Piker, all right. Sheila, born in 1693, died in 2126. Eber, 1723, died in 2187. Pele, 
we worry about because he didn't live very long. We're starting to worry about our kids. Peleg, 1757, died in 1996. Just lived for 239 years. You can see that Peleg died before Noah. Ru lived for 239 years, died in 2026. Sarag, 1819, died in 2049. He lived 230 years. Nahor, poor guy, only lived for 148 years. He also died before Noah. He died before Noah died. Terah lived 205 years. He died in 2073. Notice he died before Noah, but not before Shem. Not before Shem. And finally, we get to the big dude. Abram, he was born in 1938, and he died in 2113. He lived 175 years. I'll leave this up. I'll come back to it. But I'll leave this up for you guys to kind of look at a little bit. What I find interesting is you start to see this God slowly walking back the ages of, of, of men. God said right before the flood, I'm going to limit their lives to 120 years, and he's starting to implement that. Because you see, Noah lived 950 years, Shem lived 602, but these guys right here, about 400 years. Our facts had Sheila and Eber, about 400 years. These guys right here, Peleg, Rul, Sirug, about 200 years. So he's cut 200 years off these guys. 900, 600, 400, 200. And then it becomes very rare for anybody to live very long, okay? Just some interesting things that I see in this. Hopefully you can look at it yourself, but Abram was born in 1938. Noah died in 2006. It's entirely possible that Abram could have met Noah. According to these genealogies and the numbers that were given, I mean, if I was Terah, if I was Nahor, and Noah was somewhere around, I would take my kids to go meet the old man, all right? Can you tell them about the flood, okay? How did God speak to you? What did he tell you to do? What exactly is a cubit? That would be my first question. Exactly how long is a cubit? <laughs> All right. We really don't know anymore how long was a cubit. Abram could have. He could have talked to Noah. Second thing is, is that Abram died before Shem. All those things that happened to Abram were happening at the same time that Shem was up there somewhere. They don't tell us where Shem lived, but Shem was up there somewhere when God called Abraham, when, uh, when, when Terah went from Ur to Haran, when God called Abraham out of Haran and down into uh, Canaan. Shem was around. Shem was around. We don't know if Abram checked in with Shem every now and then, his great, 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 great grandfather, but, but he was there. He was there. We know that he left Haran when he was 75. I believe that's right. I believe that's right, Keith. Didn't he, he left Haran at 75. I didn't put a note in there. No. And so uh, he left Haran at 75. And so that was 230, 230, 357 years after the flood was when God finally decided it's time to call my own people. It's time for me to, to start this process. It's going to take quite a few years, but I'm going to start the process of, of uh, calling the Hebrew nation together and, uh, and, and preparing the way for, for my eventual, for my son. So that's it. Yep, don't wanna do that. That's it. Let me back up a little bit. Let me just get to a, 
Maybe I can do it this way. Yeah. I'll just leave this up. Let me see where he says show me in that And I'm open for comments. Mm -hmm. Would would you explain for dad again the birth order of the boys and uh, why, Noah's sons? Why yeah. they're why they're listed the way they are and how you came up with the, uh, I don't have my Bible in front of me. I should have, but um, there are three accounts uh, that list that same Shem, Ham, and Japheth in the in those other sections. Mm -hmm. Three times it, it lists Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Yeah, but Ham is definitely the younger. It's in uh, nine, chapter nine, verse something or other. It says that that Ham is the youngest. It, it explicitly says that. And then the, uh, the, 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 the deduction that uh, Shem is the middle one, I can't remember how I got that. Uh, in the 18th verse of the ninth, it lists the Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It does the same thing uh, twice after that. It yeah. lists the same order. Oh, yeah, they're always listed that way. It's always listed Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But that's not the birth order. The birth order is Japheth is the oldest, Ham, Shem is the middle, and Ham is the youngest. Keith is not sure. I'm going to have to send you an email, Keith. Okay, and and uh, and show you that. Yeah. Oh, over oh, a cup of coffee. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, a cup of coffee. Well, David, there's times. I mean, I, you don't like to move ahead, but when we talk about Esau and Jacob, it's usually Jacob and Esau. Yeah. Um, we we name Jacob because I don't know he's the most famous or uh, God's favored one or however you want to say it. And but in the birth order, he was second. So, was second. right? Yeah, there's no reason. I mean, uh, I think the writer probably had a reason for the way he listed Shem, Ham, and Japheth, because I think it because of their importance to the lineage of story. who comes later. So, yeah, it's it's it. I can't remember the the scriptures. I'll just have to go look that up. But uh, okay. okay, I'll pay for the coffee. It, it explicitly oh. says in. My Bible's right over there. Yeah, it's 924 yeah. is where it says that Ham is the youngest. Yeah, 924 is, uh, thank you, that's what it is. And getting that, that uh, Japheth is the oldest is a little more convoluted, but it, 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 it eventually makes sense. I'll get that for you. It's no. Don't it's just interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times these little interesting tidbits, you know, become significant. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Okay. There we go. Certainly, uh, you know that that little little subtle thing about entrance into the ark and then God telling Noah exiting the ark exit with you your wife your sons and your sons wives that's the order and 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 Noah ignores the order he goes out first himself then his sons then his wife then his sons wives and I think that ties into this story of of what was Ham doing around his father's tent to begin with and and where was mrs noah i i tie that right back there to the to the part of uh of genesis where uh god told them to exit the ark you your wife your your sons and your son's wives i think there's something to be learned from that that the subtle it's very subtle a lot of times the bible is very very subtle it doesn't shout suggests
David? Yeah. You were talking about ages, and I I just finished reading Deuteronomy the other day. Moses died when he was 120 years old, it says. So yeah. that's right on peg with what God, where God was taking him. So. Yep. Yeah, and if, if, if you look up, if you just Google the oldest person in the world right now, okay, it's always a Japanese lady. She's always 118, all right? And she dies, and it's another Japanese lady that's 116, all right? Takes her place. So, you know, even today, nobody lives past 120. It's always some Japanese lady. I did that one time when I was teaching this at uh, Metro, and I just, just so I know who the oldest person in the world was. Google is great for that sort of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was a Japanese lady at some nursing home in Yokohama that, uh, that was 118. And she died last week, but there's another lady in Nagasaki that's, uh, you know, takes her place. If you want to outlive your wife, don't marry a Japanese lady. So, uh, yeah. Marty is waving at Lori there. Oh, she's David, waving bye bye. Yeah. Dave, there isn't I I'm curious. I should have done some research, but when it talks about Noah's nakedness, there isn't that isn't some euphemism for Mrs. Noah being in the tent with him at the time, is it? I don't think so, because it, it kind of says okay. he's drunk and passed out. You know. Now, Mrs. Noah is just not around. I mean, she's just not mentioned. Well, I wouldn't be with a drunk and disorderly guy anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. I mean, Don has put up with you all these many years. Yeah, I all guess. Sudden, you went on a bender and you were you know, <laughs> right around in the yard. And she would go, stupid old man. I shouldn't have married him, but I am. And I'm going to take care of him. Come on, wake up, darling. All right. Just disorderly, not drunk. Put it, put it, put it, <laughs> put a towel around you, and let's get back into the house. <laughs> before the neighbors see, certainly before the kids get here. <laughs> not speaking for Donna, that may not be exactly the way she would do it, but. Uh... Winston, did you need to unmute? <laughs> I know he got, had a comment, a and I, I saw him laugh. <laughs> Noah, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. No, uh, my take on that was Mrs. Noah was probably outside the tent, and she told the boys, you guys get in there and take care of that old man. <laughs> <laughs> take care of your father, yeah. yeah. Go, go take it. care of your father. I'm not thing, going yeah. to. <laughs> We're, we're participating right now in what's known as midrash. It's, uh, it's, it's extra biblical uh, conjecture of what was going on. Yeah. Well, I was trying to figure out, now Peleg owned the ship, uh, the Essex, that, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, how does that fit in? Peg, peg leg, yeah, yeah. Peg leg, uh, yeah. <laughs> so one thing I was going to say was thinking about it, you know, um, your, your explanation of, you know, why does Abraham curse Canaan? Why doesn't he curse Ham? And it has to do with the undercutting of his status and authority as, as father. So that's an interesting thing, really, when you look at how family dynamics play out in Genesis, you know, that, that Jacob, when he deceives Isaac by going in disguised as Esau, you know, really undercuts the authority of his father to execute what his father wants to execute there. Yeah. And then same thing when the brothers um, of Joseph, you know, lie to their father about uh, Joseph's uh, you know, mm -hmm. being killed by a wild animal is what they say. And, you know, so, so yeah, there seems to be this recurring theme of, uh, and, and 
I mean, the fathers have th their problems too in those stories as well. I mean, it's not just drunken Noah, but, um, but still there's this thing of, of uh, sons undermining fathers. Yeah, and, and I, I didn't put this in there, but I thought also of, of you know, when, when we finally get around to the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, four, four, five, or six, uh, you know, is uh, honor thy father and mother. And uh, you can't help but when you read that, think back to Ham and uh, all the situations where the kids didn't honor their father and mother. And so it's... You know, I think the Lord puts in those commandments when we need them. You know, he, he didn't say in the Ten Commandments, mothers love your children. Okay, that wasn't necessary. Okay, it wasn't necessary for the Lord to tell mothers to love their children. It was necessary for him to say, honor your father and mother. Okay, uh, do well with your father and mother. Kind of like, I, I, you know, there's just not any stories in Genesis about trying to teach mothers how to, to love their daughters. <laughs> you know, I, there's, it's not necessary. It's really necessary for God to teach men how to treat their wives. It's really necessary for God to teach men how to raise their sons and daughters. And, uh, and so that's the, those are the stories of Genesis. And uh, I, I was very serious. I, I, I say it in kind of in jest, but I'm serious. I mean, that's why are there so many stories here in the initial book of the Bible, the, the story of first things, that most of the stories about men. Well, we need more help. We, we, we need a lot more training. We need a lot more guidance. Lori's not saying a word. You know, I'm not going to say anything to that. <laughs> Biddy, your turn. Uh, both planes, no exit. <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, all the genealogies and all of that stuff is just not anything I can grab onto or retain or formulate any thought over. So it's just, it's like a nonstick surface. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it is, a lot of this genealogy stuff. But, you know, as I thought about all these genealogies, I mean, there's, a lot, you know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, three of them, at least, are genealogies, all right? Uh, so, you know, a little less than 30%, or a little more than 30, a little less than 30% uh, are, are, of, the, of the whole narrative is genealogies. And so, I, I Biddy, I, this used to be the, the, the chapters on the genealogies where I used to just Page through, yeah, pay leg, okay, uh, yeah, 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 okay. Rue, unpronounceable names with strange numbers on it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not even sure that, that these are, you know, you, you go to the genealogies in, in Matthew, and a lot of them are not the same genealogies. There's people that are left out. There's people that are uh, included that, that weren't in the first one. So uh, I think it's, it's not a history book as much as it is a, a theology book. They're trying to tell us something about how to live uh, more than they are trying to tell us. I really appreciate the work you've done or yeah. given to us because I had never looked at the genealogies like that. I just see those genealogy pages as bonus when I'm reading through the Bible in a year. I go, yeah, I can move ahead fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember I was, I was teaching this at, at Metro and I, I, you know, I thought, well, I'm an accountant. I know how to do spreadsheets. 
I'm going to just dig into this thing. And so this, this stuff that I've, that I've got here on the, with the numbers, I just kind of started adding and subtracting. Um, when I, when I finished it, I would usually send it to my, uh, to Hayden, Hayden Tra uh, Trauber. I don't know if you know the Traubers, uh, Brian Sherry Trauber's son. He's, he's, he's on the autism spectrum and I would ask him to check the math. And uh, he would, he, he, uh, he would go back and make sure I did the math right. And, uh, wow. and I, cause he found an error one time. I, I forget exactly what it was, but I'd presenting it in there. He's sitting over in the audience. He said, you made a math error right there, you know? And so. <laughs> the economist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, he's. <laughs> People have different gifts. Wapner. Yeah, people have different gifts. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Dennis's son-in-law, Andrew Martin, who was, he and Amy Joe were missionaries to Africa. Um, he was talking about his situation. It wasn't with him. It was with another missionary friend where he had been uh, teaching about the birth of Christ. And it might have been out of Matthew. Um, but he decided, oh, I'll go ahead and start with the genealogy. And so he did, and then, you know, got into the stories, which was really what he was interested in. And um, he got some really like excited feedback after, and actually what they were excited about was the genealogy. Yeah. <laughs> and so some of our response to it is cultural, you know, like there's just something that doesn't resonate with us in the way that it would in, uh, some other cultures, you know, where that's meaningful stuff, you know, you're talking about substance, um, a genealogy of Jesus, you're saying he's a real person uh, by telling his genealogy. I think, I think, I think you're right to tie it into culture, Jay. Uh, in the, in the same way that as, as Americans, you know, we, we're, we're taught doesn't matter who your father was, doesn't matter who your grandfather was, you're your own man, you know, you can make your own future, you know, go to it, son, get going. You know, that's kind of been our cultural mm -hmm. DNA. The other thing that's, that's, that's true, I, I mentioned it in the lesson today, we don't pay attention to the meaning of names. You know, right. you're Jay. Yeah, well, that's Jay. What, what, does, what does J mean? What's the meaning of J? Well, it means J. Uh, you know, it, 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 there's no, you know, there's no significance behind the, 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 the meaning of the name. It's, we, we don't do it. We just don't do that. But in, in these, the, the names meant something, you know. The, it, was, it was a significant event to name a child. Yeah. When I well, both of those called, true. when I called my kid a knucklehead, it meant something. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that you and I were very much alike. That's exactly what I called my son. I call I call my son consumption unit one. I call my daughter consumption unit two. Here consumption unit one. Okay. <laughs> How long, old child, are you going to be a consumption unit? When are you going to turn into a production unit? Okay. Did you get that from the Coneheads on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> no. no, I got oh, that. Totally, that sounds like something the Coneheads would have come up with. I got that from reading too many economics textbooks. Here, you have one unit of consumption, and you add to that a second unit of consumption. How many? What's the total consumption? What's the marginal consumption? What is the average consumption between the two? Uh, yeah, I've got two consumption units at home. <laughs> you didn't try to think of ways to turn them into productive units at a young age? I, no, I, I told them that, you know, they can be consumption units until they graduate from college, and then they will be production units. <laughs> Stars. Uh. Unfortunately, they have turned into production units, so... <laughs> That's funny. That's good. <laughs> that is good. 
my first wife didn't find it amusing, by the way. Here, consumption unit one. That's Peyton. No, that's that's consumption unit one. <laughs> <laughs> that is consumption unit one. <laughs> that's good. See you. It's gonna be my next dog's name. I'll call him <laughs> <see> you. <laughs> <laughs> so is next uh, Wednesday the last of the studies? Last of the studies, yes. On uh, next next week, we will talk about the Tower of Babel and uh, how sin became so pervasive that it became a community affair. And uh, then uh, then we will uh, and we'll finish up. That'll be it. And then uh, the last Sunday of April, the last Sunday, last Wednesday of April, it'll just more or less be an open forum. Bring, reflect back on, on the class or, or we'll talk about anything that you pretty much want to talk about. I may have a little bit of a summary, but to, to kind of get things rolling to remind us of what we've done, but uh, it'll mainly be 30, 45 minutes of just open forum, mm -hmm. like we're doing right now. Yeah. What about on Sunday mornings? Are we ever going to maybe think about having class Sunday mornings again before church? Right over there. We will. Different place on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly when, we don't know, but yes. Yeah. There is a future for Bible class. Uh, David? Mm-hmm. I was wondering, are you going to somehow, or is there a way that we can see some of your slides again? Yeah, I can. Uh, I can email them, or. or uh... I'd like to take a look at some of the early ones. Okay. Uh, I have a lingering question, and I think it was covered maybe in the first or second week. Okay, I'll uh, I'll, I'll email it to you, Lindsay, or your Lindsay, your Winston, but uh, yeah. <laughs> It says Lindsay right below your your face right there. So uh, oh. <laughs> I'll get your email address out of the bulletin. Good, thank you. Or the, yeah, the directory. Directory. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking something black and white and putting some color in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful. Yeah, it's the beauty of PowerPoint. You, you, you create a PowerPoint and then it says, here's some suggested uh, formats for that. And so I say, yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm really talking about what you've said. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, All right. David. See you next week. Mm -hmm. See you next time. Thanks, right, everybody. Thank